Veer Rubin's camera is complete. Where are all those rogue planets coming from? NASA chooses suppliers for its new lunar rover and an earlier formation for the moon. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. All right, you know that I love the Vera Rubin Observatory. This is this incredible observatory being built in Chile, which will be able to observe the entire night sky from the Southern Hemisphere every couple of nights. It's gonna see to a depth and breadth that will allow us to see all of the things that the universe was doing when we weren't looking. Supernova, asteroids, comets. If Planet Nine is out there, this is the telescope that's going to find it. And now, engineers just completed the camera for Vera Rubin. And this thing is a monster. It is 3.2 gigapixels, 3,200 megapixels. There are 201 separate CCDs attached together to build this camera. Each pixel is 10 microns wide. The telescope is gonna have a field of view that is seven times bigger than the full moon. So like imagine the full moon and then six full moons around it, that big of a field of view. And yet, it can see a golf ball as a single pixel 25 kilometers away. So now that the camera is built, what comes next? So they're going to do some first light testing with the camera in August, and then the entire telescope should start to see some first light testing in early 2025, and then it should go into its full science operations in the middle of 2025. So we are almost there to see Vera Rubin come online. Where are all those rogue planets coming from? Astronomers are finding more and more of these rogue planets or free floating planets. These are just planets that are just drifting through the Milky Way. And you know, it was assumed in the beginning that it was very, very rare, but now they're finding more and more of them. And in a recent survey of the Orion Nebula, astronomers found hundreds of them. And many of these free floating planets are in binary companions. And so the question is, where are they coming from? Now, there's a couple of possibilities, right? Like one possibility is that they're just ejected from planetary systems. And we know that in the early times of a star's history, as the planets are starting to form, they interact and can have a lot of mayhem. In fact, more on this later in this episode. But many of them could get kicked out. The other possibility is that they just formed in place. Like many stars, you only have a planet's worth of material and that collapses down and so you get a planet. So researchers want to know which of these is more likely. So they did a bunch of simulations. They tried to see, can you get planets getting ejected from a planetary system at the rate that would explain the number of these rogue planets that have been found? And what they found is that with a single star system, the answer is no, you just don't get enough of these planets forming. But when you have a circumbinary system, this is where you've got two stars orbiting around each other, and then you've got a planetary system around that. And that creates enough gravitational instability that planets do get ejected. And so according to their simulation, they found that you can get between two and seven Earth mass planets getting ejected from these circumbinary systems. And we know that for the larger stars, main sequence stars and the largest stars, in fact, binaries, trinaries, like multiple star systems are more common. And so you've got these larger star systems with planets orbiting both stars, they can be shedding them out into space. And so this could be the source of rogue planets. NASA is developing its next generation moon rover. When NASA astronauts return to the moon, they're going to need some wheels. They've got to cover large distances. And we saw in the Apollo program, once the astronauts were able to bring their own lunar buggy, their rover, then they were able to make a lot more ground on the surface of the moon. They were able to go farther, they were able to examine interesting objects, bring back samples, collect material from a larger region on the lunar surface. And so, NASA knows that they're going to need a new version of their lunar rover when they go back. Now, it's not going to be in the first couple of Artemis missions, but the plan is that by Artemis 5, which is going to be in 2030, the astronauts should have a rover there on the surface of the moon that they can access. So this week, NASA announced the three companies that they've awarded contracts to develop plans for a lunar rover. One familiar name, Intuitive Machines, and then there's a company called Lunar Outpost and Venturi Astrolab. 
Now the three companies are going to have 12 months to develop their concept for the rover. And just like the Apollo moon buggy, these are going to be unpressurized. So the astronauts are going to have to wear their spacesuits while they're sitting in the rover. But we've got a lot of new technology. And so one of the requirements that NASA wants is that this thing can be autonomous, that the astronauts can be walking around on the surface of the moon and the moon buggy can be following them remotely or an astronaut could be piloting it from the research station while it's moving around on the surface. And so that gives the astronauts a lot more flexibility in what they do. So we don't know exactly what these things are going to end up looking like who's going to win the final contract to build this thing. So they've got 12 months to develop their concepts further. Slim survives another lunar night. Okay, this is just an amazing story. Jax's slim lander landed on the moon. And as you probably recall, it landed upside down with its solar panels pointing away from the sun. And so during the lunar day, no sunlight was falling on its solar panels. But at the end of the solar day, just as it's about to go into night, the sunlight finally creeps around the corner and is able to fill the solar panels and was able to provide power to the lander. And this this is already a fairly tricky, precarious situation. There's not a lot of science work that it's able to do upside down. But JAXA was amazed to find out that it had survived the first lunar night. And keep in mind, temperatures dip down to minus 130 Celsius. And this is the battery killer. And yet it was able to survive that first lunar night and it was able to survive a second lunar night. But the problem, of course, is it happens right at the end of the lunar day. It gets a little bit of sunlight, powers up its systems, takes a couple of pictures, sends some data home, and then lunar night kicks in and then it goes to sleep again. So I guess we're going to find out will Slim survive another lunar night? Testing out hopping on the moon. The other lunar lander mission that we've been tracking is Intuitive Machines Odysseus Lander. And this is the one that landed really hard, broke one of its legs and fell over onto its side. Now, it didn't survive the lunar night, but Intuitive Machines is still moving forward with their plans to continue sending missions to the surface of the moon. And so one of the ones that I want to focus on now is called IM2. And this is going to have a whole bunch of experiments on board, a mixture of private and public ones. But one subcomponent that I want to talk about today is called the SP Hopper, the South Pole Hopper. And this is a little sub spacecraft that's going to travel with the IM2 lander. It's only 35 kilograms, it's about 70 centimeters high. So I don't know, two feet. There, there's two feet for the people who speak Imperial. It will separate from the lander and then it's going to attempt to make a hop. So first it's going to try a 20 meter hop. And if that works, it's going to try to do a 100 meter hop where it's going to blast off the surface, travel and then land. And like the moon is airless. So you can't use a helicopter like they did with Ingenuity on Mars. It's got to be purely from propulsion. And so this hopper is going to test out being able to do these hops across the surface. And this is important because there's a lot of terrain on the moon that you just don't reach with a rover. You know, if what you want to roll across is this flat, smooth terrain, that's not as interesting scientifically as the really cool leftover volcanoes and crags and the sides of craters and chasms and valleys and all kinds of really interesting terrain. You want to get in there. Lava tubes. So this hopper will test out. Can you hop across the surface of the moon? If that works, then future hoppers will be deployed in places that are hard to reach. And then they can hop into lava tubes to the tops of mountains down crater walls. So hopefully if this technology works, we're going to see a lot of hoppers on the moon while we have helicopters on Mars. Every week we put up a poll where you tell us what you thought was the most interesting space news. And this was a landslide. I think this is the clearly the most conclusive vote we've ever seen. And this was that astronomers caught a supernova in real time. So thank you everybody who voted for last week's stories. Now we're going to put the new poll up into our community tab within about 24 hours of when we release this video. And so if you want, go look in the community tab, you'll see the vote. But if you're just scrolling YouTube, you should see our vote pop up and just give a second, give it a vote. And that tells us sort of what stories you're most interested in. Of course, the best thing you can do is 
click on the subscribe button and then click on the notifications bell. So that way you'll always know when we've got new content on our channel. What is the earliest that the moon could have formed? The standard theory is that the moon formed when a Mars sized object crashed into the Earth shortly after the formation of the solar system. And there was this time in the early solar system when there was a lot of things migrating around crashing into each other, we can see even that the surface of the moon is covered in craters many happened early on in the history of the solar system. But it would be really useful to know exactly when the moon did form. Now there's three lines of evidence that tell geologists when the moon might have formed. The first is Jupiter's migration because it's believed that when Jupiter migrated early on in the solar system, it kicked a lot of objects around and one of these would have been this Mars sized planet Thea that then crashed into the Earth. Jupiter did its migration between 37 million and 62 million years after the formation of the solar system. So that gives you a date. The other line of evidence is the decay of hafnium into tungsten. When the moon formed, it had a certain amount of hafnium in its rocks and then it was decaying. And so by measuring the samples that were turned back from the Apollo astronauts, geologists were able to determine from that half life that that formation happened about 50 million years after the solar system formed. But the third line of evidence is the crystallization of the rocks in the lunar surface. And based on the amount of cooling time that it would have taken, it looks like the moon formed about 200 million years after the formation of the solar system. And so like one of those lines of evidence is not like the others. So researchers simulated that early impact. And what they found is that if you get a reheating event, if you have the early formation of the moon, say at around 50 million years after the solar system, and then it gets reheated, then that can push back that geologic evidence to a later date. So it looks like the earliest the moon could have formed is about 50 million years after the Earth did. Simulating a neutron star surface. Neutron stars are the result of supernovae, where a star with more mass than the sun detonates as a supernova, it implodes and you get this remnant inside the neutron star, where the protons and the electrons are smirched together to create a ball of neutrons. But it's more complicated than that. It is spinning rapidly, in some cases up to a thousand times a minute. It's surrounded by swirling magnetic fields that are interacting with material on the surface of the neutron star, as well as material in the environment around it. And it is incredibly complicated. And yet we see that neutron stars can produce these flares. There's an instrument on board the International Space Station that's only job is to search for flares coming from neutron stars. And so one of the big questions that researchers have is like, what are the conditions on the surface of the neutron star that lead to the flare? And they have been doing simulations in two dimensions, but obviously the universe is in three dimensions. So they use a supercomputer to actually take their 2D simulations and expand them up to 3D simulation. And they were able to accurately recreate the kinds of flares that we see on neutron stars. And the thing that's really interesting is that their 2D simulations were pretty good. So you can use the 2D simulation to give you a rough approximation of what you would see in the three dimensions. We only cover about you know, eight or nine stories here on Space Bites, but we're working on 30 to 40 stories on Universe Today. And then I will cover all of those stories in the newsletter. So just to give you an idea of some of the other stories that we're working on, Curiosity has finally reached an ancient debris channel that really looks like a flowing river. Do you want to leave the solar system? Here's the good route to take and a new technique for mapping full lava tubes on the moon or Mars from space. Again, I send out this newsletter every Friday. It is gigantic. I write every word. It's completely free. So you can sign up, go to universe today.com slash newsletter. Now I'm going to talk about the upcoming solar eclipse. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Antonio Lofi Lara, David Gilton, and Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Anstis, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Filer Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. Like many of you, I am getting ready to go and see this year's total solar eclipse. This is the one that's going to start in Mexico, go through the United States, up into Canada, and then off into the Atlantic Ocean. And it's April. 
And so weather in Canada typically is bad. And so I chose to go see this in Texas. And right now the weather forecast looks pretty bad, which means that I'm going to have to get clever and creative to be able to see this total solar eclipse. But I just wanted to provide you with some suggestions and ideas if you want to maximize your chances of seeing the solar eclipse. So the first thing is that you really need to treat a solar eclipse like a heist, not like a party or a picnic. You're not going to gather a bunch of your friends and you go down and sit under the solar eclipse and enjoy it. You need to be ready for bad weather and you need to be able to move and you need to consider how are you going to be able to follow the eclipse track either north or south from where you are to maximize your chances of being able to see it. Have this plotted out. Think about the kind of traffic that you're going to be facing as you go along this eclipse path. The place that you see the eclipse, it doesn't matter. You can see it from the side of the road. It's fine, but you want to get to 100%. If you've never seen a total solar eclipse before, I do not recommend that you attempt to take pictures of it, try to capture it with your telescope, any of that kind of stuff. It's so complicated. And really, your first solar eclipse, you just want to experience it, just appreciate it. Of course, I have to say, be safe. That don't look at the sun with your bare eyes. Have a pair of eclipse glasses or a proper solar filter on your binoculars or telescope if you're going to attempt to look at it. You want to have your eclipse glasses on right up until the sun completely goes behind the moon and then it's safe to look at the moon without your glasses and you can see the corona. It's an amazing experience. And then keep track of where the eclipse is and right at the appointed time, put your eclipse glasses back on, protect your eyesight. All right, good luck to everybody to be able to see this year's total solar eclipse. I hope we all see it as much as possible. All right, we'll see you next week.